G'day guys and welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, getting back on the content for this year's upcoming draft. Obviously, I've made a bit of content in recent times around previous drafts, uh, given the 2023 draft content a little bit of time to breathe. I was uh, hoping to do a phantom draft, you know, sometime soon, but... As it currently stands, I'm looking at my current Phantom Draft uh, that I did a number of weeks ago, and I don't think we've learned enough in that time to really have another crack. So hopefully in the next week or so, we get a bit of goss and uh, I'll be able to make some changes. But in today's video, I'm gonna be taking a look at each individual club and specifically their first selection in this year's draft and trying to come up with the ideal first selection for that club based on their list needs and of course their draft position. So, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, everyone would say Harley Reid is their ideal first round pick um, or someone like a Fremantle who we know is on the market for a small forward. Yeah, sure, at pick 37, their ideal pick would be Nick Watson. I've tried to keep this uh, as realistic as possible and kept players within a certain range as a likely possibility for their club. And in my opinion, the players I've selected would be ideal first picks for each respective club. So I've gone through the 18 clubs. I'm gonna go through in order of which they enter the draft. So not alphabetical order like I normally do. And I'm gonna talk you through who I think is their ideal first pick. And what I've also done is picked 18 different players. It gets a little bit hard when Port Adelaide enter the draft to pick 73. Um, and same with Brisbane, it picks in the 30s. Like it's a little bit tough, but I've still had a crack and I've named 18 different draftees. If you could do me a little favor before we crack into the video, if you could subscribe to the channel, if you haven't already, it would be much appreciated. Aiming for 24,000 by the actual draft. That would be an amazing goal to hit if you guys help me get there. So cheers. All right, like I said, I am gonna go through all 18 clubs in the order uh, of which they enter the actual draft. So we'll get the easy ones out of the way first. West Coast enter the draft at pick one. Their ideal first pick is going to be Harley Reid. You'd think there's no real suggestion other than Sam McClure that uh, they're, they're gonna take anyone else. It just it, it isn't going to happen. They'll either trade the pick, um, in which case I think their ideal first pick would probably be still having access to someone like a McKercher or Dersma or maybe Curtin, but probably not of their first pick. So that's probably a contingency if they did trade the pick. But at this stage, it's more than 50-50 that North Melbourne aren't going to be able to trade for pick one. Therefore, Harley Reid to West Coast makes sense. Equally, Jed Walter at Gold Coast to pick probably the bid's going to come at pick two, they think. Um, so either way, Jed Walter's going to end up at the Gold Coast Suns. There's no real... There's no other way this, this goes down. So Jed Walter to the Gold Coast Suns, it's going to happen. That kind of eliminates the two obvious ones. North Melbourne enter the draft at pick three. So this is an interesting one where they've got two picks in a row. And I feel, and it seems to be the commonly held view, that Colby McKercher will be their first pick. So I'd say that's probably, you know, I mean, I could say Harley Reid sliding to pick three is possible, but it's it's not. In terms of list need, you know, is another midfielder necessarily what North Melbourne need? Uh, I probably wouldn't say it's their number one priority. You'd probably say a key back, but they're not gonna reach for a key back with their first selection when Colby McKercher, at least in my opinion, and many others, is the best available talent. So Colby McKercher, North Melbourne, and that kind of rounds out some of the more obvious ones of this upcoming draft. So then we have Hawthorne entering the draft at what is likely gonna be pick five after the Jed Walter bid. Now this one is a little bit more ambiguous. Now I've held pretty firm on the view that Zane Dersma is their ideal first pick, and I'd still say that's probably still ideal. Now different people think Zane Dersma is probably more likely to go to North Melbourne in the, in the previous pick, pick four. I haven't really completely shifted over to that line of thinking yet. I think Dersma may still be available, but even if he's not, that's not necessarily the point of the video. Dersma is still somewhat a chance to get to pick five, and I think that is Hawthorne's ideal first pick. I don't think I see a scenario where they prefer Daniel Curtin or prefer Nick Watson. I'd be very surprised. I think Dersma on talent uh, well, as you can see, I think uh, Toomey rates him as the third best player in the competition right now or in the draft pool. Either way, at pick five, Dersma would be a great selection for Hawthorne. And I'd say that's uh, their ideal first pick, sort of best case scenario. Then we've got the Western Bulldogs entering the draft at uh, likely pick six. Now, this is the one that I'm the least committed to. I found this particular pick out of all 18 uh, quite tough because... There's different schools of thought on, on which way the Bulldogs will go here. So they're gonna get another key forward later with Jordan Croft. The chances of them looking at a key positional player, someone like a Nate Caddy in this particular instance, 
Really unlikely, in my opinion. But they are kind of just in a, in a good position to go the best available small. And when I say small, I just mean non-key position. So there's a few options. There's a bit of a school of thought. They'd be looking at someone like a Riley Sanders with this pick. Um, there's probably not a realistic chance they go Daniel Curtin. I wouldn't say that's their best case scenario here. They could pick him, but you know, having drafted Buzzlinger two years ago, probably doesn't really make sense for where they're at. I reckon they're more likely to go small. And then, of course, there's key forwards coming out the wazoo. Does someone like a Sam Darcy end up as a back anyway? So for me, I think the best case scenario is probably having access to Nick Watson. Now, this may not be the pick that they actually go with. I think someone like a Sanders is likely to be available anyway. So they're going to have the choice between the two. But if I had to pick one, they probably are looking on the market for a small forward. Nick Watson is a potentially generational small forward with the, the amount of talent this kid actually has has. And I think despite his small frame, he's also a player that will come in and potentially play a role from, from season one because he doesn't rely on winning the ball himself. He's just a crafty player that's in the right space at the right time. He's hard to catch. I think he could play early. And when you contrast that to someone like a Riley Sanders, he's going to take some time to come on. And even though they probably would look at midfielders probably in the near future, uh, Nick Watson's probably just shade Sanders as my best case scenario for the Bulldogs. Then we've got Melbourne entering the draft at what I think will likely be pick eight. And this one is, again, a little bit, uh, it's not obvious who they would necessarily go. Um, yes, there's a bit of a need for a key forward, so I've got someone in mind for that. Um, but, you know, they could easily just go best available. Midfielder, they could go with Nick Watson. They're in a good position here to go best available. But if I'm going to consider their needs, I will dial back to that key forward need, and I'll say Nate Caddy would be a really good selection for them. They're not, a, you know, beyond the possibility of taking someone like a Daniel Curtin if he's available this pick. Do they have a specific need for a key back? I'm not actually really too sure. I think Nate Caddy makes a little bit more sense. And on talent, this is probably about right. He's a bit of an undersized key forward, but you know, so is Charlie Kerno. He's grown a little bit. He's about 193, 194. And I think he could play early as well because uh, he's pretty well built and um, his reach, um, he's got a huge wingspan, allows him to sort of play above his height. So I think Nate Caddy to the, the Ds would be their best case scenario from my opinion. So then that leaves GWS. And this is another tricky one that's a little bit ambiguous because looking at what their list needs are, they're probably looking at a key forward. They're probably, I still think, probably looking to replenish some midfielders after losing Taranto and Hopper. And they didn't massively address that in last year's draft. So there's a few things to consider here. I've actually gone with one a little bit left field. So uh, I, I opted against saying Nate Caddy for them because I've already got him to Melbourne. So by that logic, if Melbourne is, uh, their best case scenario is Nate Caddy is available, then in theory, he shouldn't be available for GWS. So I contemplated two different picks in this scenario and I've decided to go with Daniel Curtin. Now, I'm sure people will look at that and say, well, they don't really need a key back. That's probably true. But Daniel Curtin as a, as a prospect is a little bit more versatile than that. And he isn't a clear cut key back anyway. Couple with that, he seems to be like a really, really dialed in kid, like interviews pretty well. Seems like he'd be a one club player. Therefore, I think that in particular will appeal to the GWS Giants. And on talent, if he's still available pick nine, I think it's a no brainer the Giants pick him up. So does he become a key back? Does he become a midfielder? I'm not too sure. You know, they've got a potential long-term partner to Sam Taylor there if he does end up as a key back. But for me, I see his future probably be a bit more like a dangerous rebounding defender. And that is so typical of the way the Giants play that I think he would work well in their system. So I'll go with Dan Curtin as the best case scenario for GWS. Then we've got the Geelong Foot Footy Club entering the draft at pick 10. Now, this one, they are going through a bit of a list transition, which makes them an interesting case study. Um, so they probably, in theory, have needs everywhere, or at least it's probably more correct to say they're in a position to go best available talent. I would probably be looking at the midfield if I was the Cats, and that is the big footy rumor that that is probably the way they're going to go with that first selection, assuming they don't trade it. Obviously, this entire video is based on the premise that there's no trading. So Geelong. I'd say the best case scenario that is somewhat realistic is Riley Sanders still being available to them. Now, some may disagree on whether that's realistic. Does he get past GWS? He would be another really good fit for the Giants. But I think Riley Sanders, as the Lark medalist, that would make him the second best pure midfielder available in this draft. And I think the Cats are still probably considering their, you know, their rolling over of a new era, a new generation of midfielders. They've drafted Clark, they've drafted uh, Nevitt, traded in Braun. I think they can still add to that mix. And Riley Sanders on talent would be absolute best case scenario. Then we've got Essendon. This one, again, is a, a little bit trickier to plot exactly what way they're going to go. 
Um, obviously, with a busy trade period, they got their key defender. They lost another key defender. Um, so they could be on the market for that, or they could just sort of go with the best available running defender or a medium type. And that's why I think James Leake is actually a really good fit for them. And I think that's who I had them taking in my last mock draft. So James Leake has really bolted up the rankings in recent times. I think Callum Toomey said a number of weeks ago, that, or maybe less than that, that he is a likely top 10 pick now. Me plotting out my top 10, I find it hard to have him higher than any of the guys I've mentioned so far. So him be still being available at what is going to be pick 11 to Essendon, I think is a great result for them. And it is still kind of a positional list need that they have as a quality running defender who is also versatile. So that's the way I'd think they would go if they had the players available to them that I think they will, if that makes sense. Then we've got the Adelaide Trows likely entering the draft at pick 12. And uh, they're an interesting position here because they've got three picks in that top 20 odd, I think, as it currently stands. And in terms of their needs, I would say there's two ones that come to mind. I would say bolstering the midfield, particularly on the inside, ideally, uh, but generally just uh, continuing to add young midfield talent to their list. We know they've got a great forward line. We also know that they probably have a longer term key back issue. So obviously Makassi retired. He was pick six a couple of years ago. They had some injuries this year as well. They've lost Dode, to, uh, to, not to mention that as well. So what I think is more likely here is that Adelaide probably go best available midfielder with their first pick, assuming this guy is available. And then they're probably in a position to take a key back with their second pick because there's probably going to be some available in the teens, someone like an Ollie Murphy, someone like a Zach Ostelsky as well, who's really bolted up. So I'm a long winded way of saying Best available midfielder, I think, would be Caleb Windsor, and I think he would be a really good match for the Adelaide Crows. He's a player that I personally am a big fan of. He's got some real weapons, a really outside, classy midfielder who can really hurt the opposition, and again, who could probably play early, and I do expect Adelaide to be in the mix for finals, and so his attributes would mean that he could come in and impact even in short bursts as a outside midfielder. So Caleb Windsor to the Crows. Again, this is a player that Toomey has said could go top 10 at the moment, and I have him here at pick 12 to the Adelaide Crows as their best case scenario. So I'm happy with that. Then the Sydney Swans enter the draft at what should be pick 16 if I've got the academy picks about right. Um, so Sydney's needs, probably a key back primarily. Um, they obviously missed out on Ben Mackay, and uh, they got Joel Hamling in as you know a bit of a stopgap option, but I think both their, their needs for a key back both are both short term and medium and long term at the moment. Obviously, Paddy McCartan unfortunately retired, so there's a few things to consider there. Now they're also getting an academy pick with their second pick in Caden Cleary. It's likely to be their second pick anyway. So he's a young midfielder. So I think they're in a position to go with a needs pick here and pick a key back. And I think their best case scenario is someone like a Connor O'Sullivan. Now Connor O'Sullivan is someone we've typically seen projected to be around that 10 to 12 range. But as there's been talk of bolters like Windsor, like James League, bolting into the top 10, we haven't really heard much talk about O'Sullivan. And while this might seem a little bit unrealistic to some, depending on how you rate this kid, there is still a silly chance that he's available at this pick. Now, if they miss out on O'Sullivan, my guess is they probably still go with the next best available key back. That's the way I think they should go. I wouldn't pick a midfielder, for instance. Uh, then there's probably Ollie Murphy and Zach Ostelsky. I, I had them picking Zach Ostelsky as a uh, bolter in my phantom draft, but that was on the proviso that O'Sullivan wasn't available. So as time goes on, I think it's increasingly possible, not likely, but possible that O'Sullivan is there. Being a New South Welshman and a really good talent, that would be the best case scenario for Sydney. St Kilda enter the draft at pick 17. Again, as we get deep into the draft, this gets a little bit harder. Uh, but St Kilda's needs probably are, eh, probably need a small forward, but probably also some outside speed. That was something that they, they looked to address in this um, the recent trade period. They got Liam Henry. Could they go uh, another similar player to that? Well, maybe not similar, but... Long story short, I've got them taking Darcy Wilson at pick 17. Well, this is their best case scenario because Darcy Wilson could go sort of like early teens at this rate. But again, as we hear more about bolters rising up, we're not really sure where Darcy Wilson lands. So again, this could be speculative, but I think it's certainly within the realms of possibility, certainly enough so to include him in this video. So Darcy Wilson as a bit of a forward utility and potentially a wingman at AFL level kind of ticks a couple of boxes here. So if I'm a States fan, that's the name that I'm hoping slides to pick 17 and it's not too crazy. Collingwood, the premiers enter the draft at pick 25, or at least that seems likely to be the case. 
again, you get, you're getting tough here. I think they're in a good position to go best available. One team we've, one player we've seen them linked to publicly is Colton Folstrup. And I think this is probably the back end of where Colton Folstrup is likely to fall. He's a powerful forward, yeah, mostly a forward now. They call him a forward mid, but we see him play mostly forward, particularly in the Waffle Seniors competition and the under-18s for Western Australia as well. Colton Falstrup is a ready-made prospect who could come in and impact pretty early, I would say. Very physically built, experienced playing against seniors. And I think from a talent point of view, at 25, this is a pretty good value proposition as well. Is it realistic? Well, we've heard rumors that Adelaide are interested, North Melbourne are interested, and I think GWS as well. And all of those guys have picks before Collingwood. But if the draft falls a certain way and those clubs find players that they prefer at each of those picks, Colton Falstrup to Collingwood, I think would be their dream draft scenario. At pick 28, we've got Carlton entering the draft. And again, I'm going to keep saying it, but as you get further into the draft, it's a little bit harder to forecast what clubs will be thinking at various picks. But we know Carlton probably are on the market for a genuine small forward. I've got Lance Collard as their best case scenario, and this is the reason why it's not so crazy. So, or at least I'll, I'll give you my reasoning for it, and you can tell me I'm crazy in the comments. But my understanding with Collard is on talent, 15 to 20, probably in this draft. But there is, there has been a suggestion that he is perhaps a little bit more unwilling than the average draftee to leave Western Australia or a little bit more of a flight risk. And therefore, that tends to influence where a draftee gets picked up. Now, there are only two WA clubs. So if that hypothetically scares off clubs, he could be available at 28. Bearing in mind, West Coast won't have had a second pick. Fremantle won't have had their first pick. So I think at 28, it's probably worth the risk to take Lance Collard. And I think he's certainly going to be the best small forward available in this draft at Carlton's pick. They could go for a Delene uh, or a uh, Phoenix Gothard, I think I had as the, as the phantom draft pick. But this is not beyond the realms of possibility that Collard's available. And I think Carlton would be very happy to snap him up. Then we've got Richmond entering the draft at pick 32. And uh, again, another team sort of like Geelong, probably looking at their list transition and having no first round draft pick in this year's draft, they're probably gonna be in a position to take best available. So they're kind of hoping there's some sliders. And I think they'll probably have a preference for midfield talent at the top of their own menu, so to speak. So who's likely to be the best available midfielder that's that um, pick at pick 32? Well, I'd probably put Charlie Edwards as the player that they're hoping slides. So there's probably some more realistic options like a Joel Frazier, I think I had in my phantom draft to them. Charlie Edwards could probably go early 20s, but at a push, he could slide into the early 30s as well. At least that is the, the way it's being described to us, is that that is probably his likely range. And I think he would be a very good value proposition. I would probably be looking at him in the early 20s myself, but Richmond, this would be their dream draft day scenario, I would say. Now we're getting really speculative. We're up to the Brisbane Lions at pick 34. Again, this is not exactly where it's gonna fall, but this is ex roughly where I think it's gonna fall if I've got a relatively good idea of how the academy picks will go. I could be wrong by a couple of picks, doesn't really matter. The Brisbane are in a position to probably take some project players, you know. Um, it's not as though, even though they're a good team, it's not as though they haven't had access to the draft. So they got Will Ashcroft, Jasper Fletcher, um, they got Levi Ashcroft. You'd think at this point, they're probably not looking for midfielders, right? So they're probably in a position to go for a more project tall. Who's the best one available around this pick? Well, it gets very subjective around this range, but I'll say someone like an Archer Reed is someone that I do expect to be available. You know, after Walter and Caddy, there's a big gap of key forwards. Then you've got Archer Reed, probably the next best. And he is a 203 centimeter, I think, you know, really raw athletic key forward. And Brisbane are in a position to probably take a punt on someone like that. I would make the same argument for someone like a Collingwood. But Archer Reed is probably the best available key forward if this is the route that Brisbane went down to. So again, this is a very speculative one. I probably have no idea who Brisbane's going to pick, but I think this would be a fairly good scenario for Brisbane. Then we're up to our final two clubs who enter the draft pretty late this year. Fremantle is going to be the next club I talk about, and I have them entering the draft around about 37 um, after the academy bids and stuff like that. So again, having lost a small forward in um, Lockie Shaw's, you would argue that's probably the main area of need. I read, I think it was Peter Bell talking about how they're pretty happy with their midfield and back line. And so this uh, draft period is where they'll be addressing the forward half of the ground. So avenues to go. So small forward makes sense. Key forward potentially makes sense. Uh, but I think there's going to be some decent smalls around this range. And one of them that is 
A good chance to be available at 37 is South Australia's Jack Deline, who's proven to be a pretty productive small forward. Um, kicked a bag, I think, in the under-18s champs for SA, and just seems to be one of those players that just hits the scoreboard. Their dream draft scenario is Lance Collard, but if I've got that for Carlton at 28, I can't put him again at 37 for Fremantle. Maybe someone like a Cohen Sanchez also fills their needs, but Jack Deline would probably be their preference, I would guess. And then we've got Port Adelaide, who currently their pick is pick 73 after the academy bids get absorbed like Gold Coast pick 20s the picks in the 20s all get absorbed in their 30s and whatever the draft will shrink so I expect Port Adelaide's pick to actually come into the 50s I'm not sure exactly where I I don't even know who they would potentially pick but I'm going to pluck a South Australian kid who um, is potentially going to be around this range in Kane McAuliffe and he seems to be like this powerfully built inside mid about 187 centimetres um, they were probably more likely to go local with this pick on the basis that in this part of the draft, you know, in theory, most of their scouting resources will be in Adelaide. So they'll probably have a bit more of a profile on those players. So that's why I've got them taking a local player. Kane McAuliffe should get drafted, but he'll be a late prospect um, at best, you would think. I'd be surprised if he went earlier than this. Another one is potentially Ashton Moyer, if I had to throw out another South Australian name. Started the year as one of the top prospects and now has fallen so far due to reasons we don't actually know. But at one point, I think Toomey had him in the top handful of players in this draft. Maybe it's questions around application. But if you have a pick in the 50s and you're a South Australian local club, you probably go for Ashton Moyer, I would say. So, But I'll, I'll, I'll back in Kane McAuliffe because Moyer could go way earlier. Anyway, guys, that is my take on every club's ideal first pick. Now, this is going to be subjective. We're all going to have different views. And I imagine I probably got most of you who go for each club to disagree with me, but that's all right. I hope I've made some sense from a logical point of view. And otherwise, if you don't have a favorite, hopefully maybe you got something out of this video. So as always, look forward to your comments in the comment section below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video, guys. Cheers.